Georgian wine exports are growing, uh, positive dynamics are maintained in strategic markets as well. The National Wine Agency says about Georgian wine exports. According to the agency, in the first six months of 2021, 46.4 million bottles of wine were exported from Georgia to 56 countries around the world, which is 13% more than the same indicator in 2020. Revenues from exported wine reached 104 million US dollars, up 7% from the same period last year. In July 2021, we returned 79% of the airlines that had operated in Georgia in 2019. We also returned 75% of those countries back with which we have direct traffic. Air traffic is restored with 72% of destinations and flight frequencies are back to normal by 74%. I would also like to say that Batumi International Airport has a 20% increase in July compared to 2019, said Mariam Krivishvili, Deputy Minister of Economy. The first cafe of Georgian brand Antra has opened in Notting Hill Gate, 138 on July the 5th. Antra Group explains that Antra London is a part of international expansion which represents the third city after Tbilisi and Baku. Antra Group made an investment 1.3 million Great Britain pounds in London the brand plans to expand in Great Britain for the near future. The 15th building was opened at Lopota Lake Resort and Spa in Kacheti, such are the news from the general manager of the hotel, Maka Ligvashvili. According to her, the company has invested 7 million lari in opening a 51-room hotel. Today, the hotel complex has a total of 232 rooms and employs 250 people, although the hotel management still plans to develop further. This is the Checkpoints, anchored and co-authored by Elena Kvantilashvili. And here I am, myself, I'm Georgi Sakaz, and we have gathered here in Forbes Georgia studio to tell you more about business and economics. 10 p.m. sharp, and here we are with more than just news. Some news are especially worth sharing, and one of them to me definitely is everything that concerns travel, flights, tourism, the most hard-hit segments during the pandemic. So let me tell you in the very beginning of the program that German low-cost airline Eurowings has started operating in Georgia and flies between Dusseldorf and Tbilisi twice a week, every Wednesday and Sunday. The first flight of Eurowings was completed on July 4, and it was practically fully loaded with 172 passengers. The main question with this particular airline is why did it decide to start operating during the pandemic when negotiations began in 2017? Maria Madamia has details. Ivan, Arnold, thank you for your time and for an interview. And of course, welcome to Georgia. And first the question is about your expectation. What do you expect from Georgian market? And uh, how do you like it? And um, is it um, an um, attractive destination for Eurowings? So first of all, thanks for having us here. Um, Georgia is a beautiful country indeed. Um, and it has a lot of potential. That's why Eurowings introduced its first routes to Georgia from Germany. Um, of course, we have high expectations. So far, the, we are happy with the bookings and we believe that the bookings will go into the right direction. Okay, and can you say much more about your future plans in our country and which cities are you going to add flights and what about the Kutaisi uh, International Airport? Of course, Georgia is always under evaluation. So um, we just started Tbilisi flat. We will first see how the route is performing and um, regarding the future, the Tbilisi is already planned for the winter schedule as well. So we will continue flying after summer in the winter as well to Tbilisi. And um, we, other cities from Germany are, are under evaluation as well as other cities in Georgia are under evaluation. So, but we will first focus on the performance of the route of Dusseldorf Tbilisi. Okay, and what about the prices? Uh, will they afford the world ticket price, I mean? Uh, so the, the, the price starts 109 euros 99 one way, 
but occasionally we are doing also sales. So um, yeah, uh, so passengers should go on Eurowings.com and check for their uh, best flights. Uh, so which destinations are the most loaded on the global market and will Georgia be uh, among them uh, in future? Um, currently we see a trend that leisure destinations are well loaded. People are willing to travel, they are yearning for uh, a vacation because they haven't had a vacation last year, a real vacation. So like Mediterranean, Greece, Spain, Palma are well loaded. So leisure market is uh, the focus of our passengers as of now. Okay, and uh, what competitive advantage uh, does Eurowings have over other uh, low budget airlines, what do you say? So. Uh, the most important, what we always say, we are really good value for money, really good quality product. Uh, one more thing what I would like to mention is also uh, the main airports and very attractive destinations we fly normally uh, in Europe. Okay. Is it very important that you enter in our marketing pandemic um, period? What does the pandemic mean for Eurowings? The pandemic has been uh, an issue for the whole aviation industry and um, we are happy that to enter a new market in Georgia even though it's a pandemic we are still in pandemic there are still restrictions in Europe but um, as we can see from for example the first flight the demand is there to fly to Georgia okay and even uh, what are the main factors uh, you look at uh, before you con um, consider expanding to a new country so we are looking the the size of the country, the catchment areas. We are looking for uh, potential flows, the indirect passenger numbers. Uh, so there are many many factors that we take into account, but also the interest from from tour operators, the interest from travelers as well. Um, we are combining all of these uh, indicators, and therefore we are. Um, this, we, we made a decision. Um, also, we were in talks with, uh, with uh, the Ministry of, of Tourism of, of Georgia, with United Airports of Georgia as well, with the airport operators. And uh, this was a really long journey and we are happy that we are here and we finally started our flights. So it's my first time in Georgia yes. and um, I'm amazed how beautiful the city is. Um, I will also tell, of course, my colleagues and friends about Georgia about the beautiful city and the and the nice cuisine here in Georgia mm -hmm, as well yeah. and um, people are very friendly so um, it's uh, it's great that you keep your uh, culture and your historical sites as it is so yeah it's a very beautiful city we are planning to return as well um, since it is a beautiful city and since we are um, currently evaluating other possible destinations mm -hmm. either from Germany or to Georgia. Thank you for your Thank time. You it was very important interview for us, for uh, Forbes and uh, for Georgia Market. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>in the very beginning of the pandemic, in the first five months of 2021, cars constituted uh, the second export commodity of Georgia. In total, $165 million, $546,000 worth of cars were re-exported from Georgia in January, May. The report published by Galton Taggart shows that the number of cars per thousand inhabitants in Georgia is 304. If we subtract the old, discarded cars, that number drops to 234. Now, Tatia Gageshwili will tell us which brand and model of cars were especially in demand during the pandemic. Opel Vectra, Opel Astra, Mercedes and C-Class. These cars are already history for our country since they have lost their popularity over the years. Today, we present the rating of the most demanded and imported cars in Georgia in 2020. However, before we talk about this rating, I will tell you that according to the statistics of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, in 2020, the number of vehicles registered in Georgia increased by 72,900 and it reached 1.4 million. This report also shows that the cars which are imported into the country, most of them are second-hand.
The ranking of the most frequently imported cars in Georgia during the pandemic year is as follows. The 10th place, Volkswagen Jetta, 1,385 cars. The 9th place, Toyota RAV4, 1,604 cars. The 8th place, Charlotte Cruise, 1,750 cars. The 7th place, Toyota Plus C, 1,896 cars. The 6th place, Ford Fashion, 1,969 cars. The 5th place, Honda Fit, 2,479 cars. The 4th place, Hyundai Elantra, 3,135 cars. The 3rd place, Ford Transit, 3,646 cars. The 2nd place, Toyota Camry, 5,104 cars. And the 1st place, Toyota Brews, 7,073 cars. The top 10 accounts for 30% of total auto imports, with the remaining 70% distributed to other models of car. According to statistics, the main market for car import to Georgia is the United States, out of which 48,000 cars were imported in 2020. Since you mentioned cars, <laughs> then let's target our industrial review to the auto industry. Here are the main trends that Anita Vaze has put together for the checkpoints. In January, May 2021, the largest import commodity group was presented in the form of passenger cars with imports amounting to $309.2 million, or 8.9% of total imports. In 2021, auto parks increased by 5% compared to the previous year, while imports of passenger cars increased by 5.1%. Top 5 imported car brands are Toyota, Ford, Mercedes, Benz, Hyundai, and Honda. In Georgia, consumers mostly buy used cars. However, the revenues of the primary market and official dealers who sell cars to the corporate sector as well as citizens are also quite large. In 2019, the company's income from the sale of cars, services, and parts are Tegeta Motors LTD, around 630 million lari, GT Group, around 270 million lari, Mercedes Benz Georgia, AKA LTD, around 68 million lari, Iberia Business Group LTD, around 67 million lari, Omega Motors LTD BMW, around 12 million lari. In addition to the pandemic, other global problems also proved to be a hindering factor for the auto industry in 2020. In particular, the problem of the production of semiconductor chips in world markets, which was caused by the increased demand for gadgets due to the pandemic, seemed to be a crucial issue. As a result, due to production gaps, there was a shortage of cars in the market. GT Motors, which combines Land Rover, Jaguar, Ford and Suzuki cars in Georgia, notes that despite the challenges of 2020, some brands such as Ford saw a 100% increase last year as a result of the right marketing campaign. Moreover, it was last year that the company received the right to become a global important firm Ford in Azerbaijan. However, there are problems in 2021 as well. Demand for cars in the market has increased, although it is in short supply. Lari exchange rate volatility has also led to rising prices. Due to global chip shortage, the supply of cars is quite difficult. Had it not been for the delivery problems this year, we would have gone up to 1,400 cars in Ford without any problems. We order cars, but they can't supply them. We have similar problems with Land Rover, Jaguar and Suzuki. In 2019, we sold 400 cars of Land Rover and 36 Jaguars. In 2020, we sold 280 Land Rover cars, but 130 Jaguar cars. This year's 100 Land Rover cars have already been sold. I also suggest that if no more problems arise, we'll go up to 250 cars. Due to the shortcomings in the production supply chain, balancing the processes in such a way that customers didn't have a problem was the main priority for Tegeta Motors for years. 
The company was founded in 1995 and it is one of the largest players in the market. It combines Porsche, Mazda, Volvo and Toyota brands. The lockdowns pushed for a shift to online sales. They managed to handle the pandemic challenges successfully, which had a positive impact on the 2020 results. By optimizing the processes, 2020 has finally been successfully completed. In 2020, the Georgian auto industry, specifically new car sales, experienced a decline of about 22%. This is not surprising because there was a decline of about 20% worldwide, which automatically affected the Georgian market. It is also important that in this overall market, which has been reduced by 22%, to get a share in total sales has increased compared to 2019. Toyota Center Tbilisi, founded in 1997, notes that due to the difficult economic situations, those who could afford to buy cars unfortunately disappeared in 2020. The company saw a 70% drop in revenue. The service was more or less active. In 2020, cars were sold without profit. The prices in the company were also maintained. The state has announced that it has opened up the economy, but that does not mean anything. The economy in reality will open up. Yes, open up when the economy starts working. The economy is not working yet. Unfortunately, the Georgian economy is tied to tourism. With no tourists entering, not spending money, lots of businesses have stopped working. Companies are in the process of developing new projects, offers and products as they have to keep up with the relatively changing consumer behavior. Future expectations are less pessimistic, although the calculation of preliminary risks is done with fairly measured caution. Elena, I think we have to mention here that the car industry globally has been quite hard hit uh, by the pandemic due to the supply constraints uh, that it had to face because of the lockdowns and well other constraints as well. Uh, yes, uh, Georgi, you're totally right. Uh, by the way, just before coming to the studio, I read uh, one global news on that, uh, mm -hmm. especially on trends of car sales uh, globally. And of course, our viewers and followers can read it on bm.g in English. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was a global disruption across trade, finance, health and education systems, businesses and societies like few others in the past hundred years indeed. If we look at findings of numerous studies conducted by EY, McKinsey, Deloitte and others globally, we can draw some very distinct conclusions. Georgi, let me highlight some with a focus on global supply chains. This is because still from outlook to outlook, the fact that global supply chains are disrupted plays a role not only on inflation and economic growth, but also in determining future already post-pandemic policies. The first risk we heard after the COVID-19 breakout was that it would pose significant challenges for supply chains globally. To this day, multiple national lockdowns continue to slow or even temporarily stop the flow of raw materials and finished goods, disrupting manufacturing as a result. But how does that affect specifically Georgia and whether or not its impact is a bit exaggerated, not only locally but globally as well? First, we asked Asian Development Bank in May 2021. You may remember at the outset of the crisis, there were concerns worldwide uh, that this could have a, a very um, uh, sweeping effect on, on food supply, disrupting food supply for, for many countries. Uh, that didn't uh, turn out to be the case, certainly not to the extent mm -hmm. that was was feared, um, and certainly was not the case for, uh, for Georgia. Despite this, ADB strongly advises Georgia to develop its agriculture sector, the sector that in Georgia is definitely the one with one of the highest subsidies support from the state budget in different forms and through different tools and facilities. However, there is always the threat of, um, of uh, uh, other countries' policies, for example, restricting exports, uh, which could have uh, an impact on, on countries like Georgia going forward. So, so this is, this is the uh, point that we were trying to, to flag. And, and we think that the pandemic situation, you know, it exposed more generally 
risks, a set of risks um, around over-reliance on certain sectors. We've talked a lot about tourism, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, I would return again to the agriculture sector as being a very good example of a sector that uh, could be developed to bring more resilience. Yes, the pandemic has not necessarily created any new challenges for supply chains. In some areas, it just brought to light previously unseen problems like the lack of diversification of the economy. So then we asked European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in July 2021 to give us specific examples of how disruptions work to this day. For example, yeah. there, there are significant uh, shortages of uh, production of chips uh, uh, in uh, global uh, terms and uh, producers of uh, high-tech products, uh, uh, cars, they, they, they already have uh, uh, problems and uh, they delay, they postpone their uh, production because of these uh, shortages. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, there is significant increase of prices of global shipping uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, they increased several times uh, compared with the previous year. And obviously now there is bigger demand. Uh, there are some bottlenecks in these supply chains and all this contributes to higher prices, but also to less uh, uh, supply. Yes, from product shortages to capacity constraints in the cargo sector, the coronavirus pandemic has impacted supply chains continuously, if inconsistently. As COVID-19 continues to deadlock the global economy, some companies have indicated that they hesitate to invest in additional capacity, which could ease some of the supply chain tensions, because they are unsure how long robust demand will continue. Because of this hesitancy, and because the path of the virus remains unclear, it is likely that supply chain disruptions disruptions will stay with us for the foreseeable future. Meanwhile, this is seriously affecting inflation globally, and for the middle to low-income countries like Georgia, impact is negative. Here is more analysis from the closed meeting where National Bank of Georgia and World Bank were in the main focus. My question concerns uh, supply chain disruptions, because we, uh, we hear this argument from Outlook to to Outlook. From, from this uh, standpoint, and this question goes uh, both to the World Bank and also to, the, uh, to Mr. Governor here. Um, uh, from this standpoint, would you say that it was uh, this threat was a little bit uh, uh, exaggerated? To our opinion, to our assessment, uh, uh, supply disruptions have had uh, a really big impact on the situation and uh, in this case on uh, inflation as well. Curfew time, yeah, I mean, you, so people cannot operate as they cannot uh, walk uh, after nine o'clock, for example, as it was a case in Georgia. But at the same time, some products need to be delivered uh, in goods uh, and, and mark, uh, in markets, for example, and there should be people who need to be work, working in those markets, right? So, but someone needs to pay for these additional expenditures. So, I mean, all this kind of this anecdotal evidence, right? But these are all the things which are um, then contributing to uh, reflecting this into prices, and then prices are increasing. There is no question. Uh, we saw uh, supply chains came under pressure, especially in the context of certain goods and certain sectors. Um, there were different reasons for that. Uh, the, the Honorable Governor mentioned that uh, uh, you had basically uh, lockdown measures that resulted in uh, production disruptions, and that led to uh, disruptions uh, in the context of global supply chain as well as, of course, uh, domestic uh, supply chain. Um, we saw that, uh, of course, the incident in the in Suez Canal uh, led to, uh, you know, additional complexities, and those complexities, in some cases, uh, are still with us. Nowadays, uh, of course, we are worried about uh, uh, supply disruptions in the context of uh, vaccines. We think that there is ample vaccine available especially in advanced economies, they can do more in terms of donating these to uh, emerging developing economies. But the donating is one thing. You need to take the vaccines to these economies and distribute within the country. In some countries, 
distribution systems are available. In some other countries, unfortunately, they are underdeveloped. Those types of distribution systems are not available. The bank uh, has been uh, very active, especially in the context of uh, low-income countries, uh, providing uh, financial, operational, and analytical support to improve uh, the distribution of uh, vaccines. Overall, we can say that COVID-19 still has accelerated and magnified problems that already existed in the supply chain. EBRD tells Georgia this could much be an opportunity and not only a challenge for Georgia. There are opportunities, especially after the pandemic. We see that the European Union is now talking and starting to do something in moving the global supply chains closer to Europe. This could be a chance, not just for Georgia, but for many countries in the uh, EU neighborhood. And to achieve, uh, to, to benefit from this, obviously uh, uh, many things should be done, but uh, this should be uh, very high on the radar. And uh, this is uh, something uh, that uh, could be a great opportunity for Georgia to increase its exports, to reduce uh, external deficits and not to be so reliant on external finance. One thing is clear, when the COVID-19 subsides, the world is going to look noticeably different. The challenge for companies then will be to make their supply chains more resilient without weakening their competitiveness. To meet that challenge, managers should first understand their vulnerabilities and then consider a number of steps, some of which they should have taken long before the pandemic struck. I think countries should do the same. 30 plus countries, 104 partner banks, 730 and more and more offers, 35.5 uh, billion euro assets invested, 355,000 customers, eight marketplaces. These are just the main figures of writhing. It was my privilege to interview CEO and founder of uh, Rising, Dr. Tamas Georgadze, Georgian. In this exclusive interview with the checkpoints, our viewers and followers will get to know this very talented businessman and his business results and plans closer. So, uh, Patron Tamas, Mr. Georgadze, thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are and uh, thank you for having us for a, such a short note uh, to we, we, we just uh, we just uh, went across of this issue because of Swiss as far as I remember the article coming from the Swiss news sources about uh, rising and deposit solution merge so it was, I think, by the end of June, as far as I remember, which was officially announced. Maybe it was a bit late while we checked it out, but congrats with the merging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgi, for inviting. I'm really happy uh, to be here with you. And uh, uh, yes, so no, the news is very fresh, actually. So we have uh, been uh, to the notary uh, only 12 days ago. So in that regard, the, we announced exactly the same day because uh, there was a danger of uh, leakage, uh, uncontrolled leakage, of course, to our partners. So we have uh, 400 banks and financial institutions, which are our partners, which, of course, need explanation of what is happening, what is relevant for them, so that we uh, release the news as soon as uh, as it was executed. Uh, there, was, uh, there was some sort of comment. When you mean uh, notary and the registering, you mean commercial register, which was also needed just to finalize the deal of merge? Uh, no, commercial registry didn't happen yet. So mm -hmm. um, uh, what what happens is that uh, the um, uh, actually signing uh, of the uh, agreement happened. There are no further closing conditions. So uh, there is uh, only formality of entering the new okay. name and the shareholding structure into the commercial registry. That's the only outstanding point. But it's a formality also um, having to do with POAs of different shareholders uh, mm -hmm. arriving in original. So uh, that is the only formality outstanding. Uh, it, it's already confirmed that it's definitely going to be under the new brand Rising DS. 
Yes, so um, the uh, company name will be changed uh, effective that date to Raisin DS uh, GmbH. So what we also said at the same time is uh, there is no change for the customers. So we have customers under multiple brands. So uh, Raisin itself has uh, a German brand called Weltspan. Uh, then there are Raisin brands in Europe. Um, uh, Deposit Solutions has a brand Save Better in the US. Um, and Savido in Switzerland. So everything on the customer side stays as is. Uh, they are also the brands uh, where not one-to-one -one corresponding to the company names uh, even before the deal. Okay. So uh, could you be so kind to describe, uh, uh, well, the reason, reasonability may be more of this merge. What are the advantages of the both sides? Why you did decide to uh, become the partners and merge your assets and all your contacts and all your uh, advantages, let me say so, to just one company, I mean yourself and Deposit Solutions. So um, the biggest advantage of our undertaking is with our clients and our partners. Um, and I will explain why, because we run a platform business. So a major part of our business is uh, in savings products, so bank savings. And as in any platform business, the offering is as good as the number of products and offerings and varieties we're offering. So combined, we have 170 banks. Uh, receiving uh, savings products and deposits through us. Uh, and that's a market increase against a standalone case. Um, and that is true also for our um, customers directly, but also for our partners, which integrate the offering through a, a B2B approach. Um, uh, and the same is true for our B2B partners, like for example, Commerzbank or Deutsche Bank or Aviva, which have now access to a number of deposit taking banks. That number will increase, thus making the offering uh, more popular with their customers um, and uh, driving more volumes uh, through their uh, through their integrated approach. So in that regard, it's uh, better for deposit taking banks, it's mm -hmm. better for um, distribution partners, and it's better for our end clients. At the same time, during the year following, you and uh, the managing partner of, uh, of Deposit Solutions, Mr. Tim Severs, if I'm right, yes, uh, about his name, yeah, and you're gonna lead the company together. And later on, uh, later on, uh, Mr. Tim Severs gonna be re uh, he will he will put himself. If I remember, it's gonna be in the uh, it's gonna be in the exam and uh, advisor. No, correct. So he will. Uh, uh, change uh, over to the advisory board, so go into a non-executive function at Raisin. He will stay with his advice and uh, and okay. with his support. He will stay a significant shareholder. So um, actually, we decided uh, very early in the process that uh, we think that uh, for um, a core CEO structure would not work over time, so for longer time. At the same time, we uh, both have expertise and we know our companies very well, so that uh, we have a certain period where we um, jointly uh, set up everything for the future success, where we um, uh, form the team also jointly for the future. And then there is uh, one CEO staying in the company and one person supporting as an active shareholder uh, and in an advisory board role. At the same time, uh, I, I, I was briefed about your, both of your quotes and uh, Mr. Sivers is mentioning that by uniting deposit solutions and rising, uh, we are transforming two German innovation leaders into the European champion with global ambitions. Uh, European championism, championship is the most quoted during this period. Thomas, you are very much aware of it. And so what is the ambitious of rising the S? So unfortunately, Germany is out. So in that <laughs> regard, uh, um, uh, it, the analogy might not be uh, a perfect one. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. I think what is true is the company, uh, the United company is one of the largest companies uh, on many dimensions, uh, uh, largest fintechs in the continental Europe. We have uh, more than 600 employees in total. Uh, we also have announced our current assets under administration. It's more than 20 billion uh, and the company is growing strongly. So with roughly 40% growth year over year, so that we have very good preconditions to form a 
globally operating company as we have uh, as the US operations uh, already uh, and uh, our second largest business in the UK actually. So uh, um, uh, we operate not only in Europe, uh, but are both founded uh, in Germany and bulk of the employees are either in Berlin or in Hamburg or in Frankfurt. So that it's, it's a German uh, startup, uh, uh, but with uh, global ambitions and having the size to be one of the European fintech champions. You still consider Ryzen a startup? Yes, I like I I love working at startups. I think that's probably a self deception. Uh, so uh, we're definitely not a corporate, uh, 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 and I think the culture is more startup like than a large corporate or a mid mid corp company. Okay, then what's the next step? Uh, what's the next step for Ryzen DS already? So what is in the pipe? Um, so um, we, um, of course, I think the uh, what I mentioned, uh, the major objective of uh, this merger being uh, making the product better. So the good thing is our full focus now is exactly on that, uh, because I think uh, a lot of our energy went into competitive bids, into um, uh, making the feature parity between the both products. Uh, and now we can concentrate on uh, on standalone the product development, which means uh, bringing new partners to new markets, which means uh, making the product features better, which means also rolling out our investment and pension solutions to more countries. And also, of course, investing significantly into the development of our still very young uh, US uh, business. Uh, so um, that will be uh, the business focus uh, uh, in the coming uh, month, uh, and uh, uh, we think that we have all preconditions. We have a great team, uh, so this is like actually the most amazing part of it is I didn't know half of the company just uh, 12 days ago, and uh, every person I learn is uh, is a positive surprise, uh, and uh, uh, and that's that's impressive. Yeah, so I think uh, I think we have all preconditions uh, to to make this a big and significant success, also for for the European economy. Thank you so much. And uh, just for you to know, we are so much proud of you and good luck to Rise in DS. Thank you very much, Georgi. Georgi, this is the most right time to tease in the new July edition of Forbes Georgia, which is loaded with diverse information, interviews, thought leader analysis, leaderboards and much, much more. 16 million Gal attracted investment, more than 627,000 registered users, 89 international partners, 354 jobs created, 4,400 B2B users. Beyond the impressive statistics are the Bank of Georgia's greatest efforts and specific names. The most prominent of these are the four winners who will travel to Silicon Valley. So think like a startup and read Forbes Georgia. So in the new jewelry issue, you will read. Empty stadiums, shortened seasons, inflated playoffs, and a year of record pay. Corner McGregor opens the top 10 highest paid athletes in the world with $22 million in sports and $158 million outside sports. You will find the rating of the Million Dollar Club in the July issue. Against the backdrop of the recently intensified demand for state-owned enterprise reform, Forbes Georgia presents a ranking of state-owned enterprises. You will get answers as to which among them are the most profitable and unprofitable. Traditionally, the lineup continues in the 30 under 30 section. You will be introduced to all six categories, each one with a winner. In the July issue, you will also read about vaccination bubbles and the illusion of success. What does behavioral science tell us? Tina Tinst Ambolishvili answers the question. Is the future of Georgian education sector and economy foreign students? Soso Ashvili shares his opinion. What is the growth rate of the Georgian economy and construction sector, as well as the effects of the pandemic? As per usual, Beso Namchavadze analyzes one of the most important sectors and the number of employees. In addition, we will inform you about the unforeseen dangers of an ugly airport. Uh, we will review the world news and travel to the past, the Kinta subculture and their place in the old Tbilisi life and economy. So, read for a century old guide to business and economic affairs. Well, yes, there is something definitely to read in the Forbes July Georgia edition, definitely is. So, my dear viewers and followers, by the end of uh, the checkpoints, before the already traditional Guillaume Moulard's rubric and very interesting piece, uh, 
Let me introduce you uh, to our new team member, Madonna Gasanova, who has worked for the checkpoints for the first time uh, together with our OT member, Nini Longuashvili. They will be focusing our attention, well, on a very specific business. Yes, uh, Georgi, we can give our viewers and followers the real rankings of Georgian painters whose paintings have hit record high values on international auctions. Niko Pirosmani leads the way with his painting Kali Lechakit, which means a woman with a hat, right. right? Yes, which was sold for 2,800,000 US dollars. We're Forbes, more <laughs> on top 10 from Madonna Gasano and Dini Longorshuli in the checkpoints. Georgian art market only counts 30 years. Therefore, there are many hindrances for its final formation. The top 10 of the most expensive Georgian artists were compiled based on the trade results of international auctions. Niko Pirosmani is at the top of the list. In general, the top priced deal for Georgian artists on auctions has amounted to $2,800,000. This is the cost for the painting of Pirosmani, Georgian woman wearing a lechaki, sold in 2018. It is not surprising that Gidil Zdanievich follows Pirosmani. He is a very important artist of the 20th century who discovered Pirosmani and it seems like their destinies have become tightly entwined. Zdanievich's artwork Dukani was sold for $2,500,000. The third is Lada Gudiashvili with $1,500,000 for his work by the Black Stream. All the listed works were sold at the international auctions. David Kakabadze, which is the fourth in the ranking, has a comparatively low price. However, the reason for this is that the works of Kakabadze are quite limited to private collections, so obtaining his work for auctions is quite difficult. This factor is one of the obstacles to re-evaluation. Number five is Merab Abramishvili. His paintings have been traded on international auctions for almost six years. Abramishvili is one of the most prominent Georgian artists whose works are presented at various auctions with prices growing from year to year. The highest cost for his work has reached $80,000. It is noteworthy that the cost of Abramishvili's works in Georgia are much higher. We should mention several artists' works, the cost of which varies from each other. This is Natela Iankoshvili, with $50,000 for one artwork and $19,000 for the other. I really regret to see that the highest price of prominent Georgian artist Elne Akhledyani's work, Street of Paris, only amounted to $39,000 on the auction. She used to live in Paris together with Gudiashvili, Kakabadze, and Ketevan Magalashvili. The figure for Akhledyani's works varies from $50,000 to $100,000 in Georgia. Artworks of modern Georgian artists like Niniko Morbedadze started to be sold at Philips auctions two years ago. The cost of her works is between $20,000 to $31,000. For the recent two years, we're witnessing a growth of the price index for Alexandre Banzeladze. Georgian artists are quite popular abroad. Some foreigners seek to have collections of Georgian painters those Georgians that are established abroad and selling works at the place. These artists also frequently come to Georgia and their paintings are purchased by local collectors. Both investment purpose and love of art are the main contributors to the purchase of these paintings. In the case of the second purpose, the cost of the work is less important for purchasers and they only choose works pursuant to their taste. The success of an artist is caused by different reasons. It is important to determine the level of professionalism of painters. Art business has its rules, required regulations and infrastructure. So if a talented artist is lucky to cooperate with a good art dealer or a gallerist, their tandem and collaboration will bring good results. This particular cooperation is fundamental for the international art market. The beginner collectors shall have proper consultations from art specialists who will introduce to important issues like the technological side of art, which artworks to purchase, which frame or color should be used in painting, and other topics because any artwork is changing from time to time and gets affected by climate, time, and other factors. So maintaining its prior form and good condition is quite important. 
The impact of the pandemic on our business was so positive that we do not even consider returning to the pre-pandemic level. For many people, art has become a space of psychological survival during such a difficult time as the pandemic. Consequently, too many collectors appeared during the pandemic. Well, it seems to me this is all for today, but you know that uh, you don't have to go anywhere yet. Yomulat will be telling you a very interesting story. Well, actually two stories in just a bit. And you also know um, to follow us on BM.G and Forbes.G till Sunday. Thank you. Mogi Salmebit. Today, I'm going to speak about two branches that directly caught my attention when I arrived here in Georgia. The first one is Gastronome, this well-known fine deli we just opened a new branch two weeks ago on Vajab Chavela in Sabutalo. At first, I was thinking this could only work among a clientele coming from posh communities of Tbilisi, such as Vake or Vera. Indeed, all can Georgians afford to pay fine products sometimes three times more than in Western Europe, for example. Then I realized that Gastronome was expanding more and more, constantly opening new shops all over Tbilisi. An impressive fact, especially in this pandemic period. How are they finding their products? Are they dealing directly with the producer or with an intermediary? What is the average margin? Who is their typical customer? A whole question that I'm going to ask to Georgi Tenadze, founder and owner of Gastronome. We established uh, our distribution company around 11 years ago and uh, from the beginning we were supplying all hotels, restaurants, cafes and it was our main business. Uh, after some, some time as we had a lot of products in our portfolio we decided uh, to open one, just one showroom to enable Georgian customers try the best delicatessen like a nice fish assortment, some foie gras, caviar, lobsters, jamon, prosciutto and so on. That's why uh, when we opened the first shop, honestly, it was like very hard times for us because people could not understand why the prices were high and why everything was so exclusive. But after the pandemic, when there was like total lockdown and so on, people started only to shop uh, and that's all. There was no any other entertaining thing. You, you could not go even in the hair salon. That's why only one thing what they were doing is that like they were coming and shopping. After this, our shop uh, became very popular and we, we decided to open the second branch in Sololaki. And also second branch uh, was very successful. That's why we decided to open the third one in Digomi to cover this area as well and uh, we were the first company in Georgia who established shop and dine concept. We are on the, in the third branch we offered uh, Georgian customers and also some expats to have shop and dine concept so that they can try the same products they buy in our store they can try in our restaurant inside the shop. Like it's already 11 years, we have our distribution company. That's why we travel minimum five, six exhibitions a year. So like every year before pandemic, we were in 10 years, we were visiting all uh, food exhibitions. That's why we were meeting all uh, suppliers face to face. So we have direct contact with everyone and we don't do any business with traders because they have high price. That's why, as you know, Georgia is quite price sensitive market. That's why you have to buy only with direct suppliers. Average margin is around 30-35% in retail. And uh, I mean, uh, we cannot add more, as I told you, because the market is very price sensitive. You know, if it has been Moscow, uh, Almaty or Kiev, you know, there you have more a chance to increase your margin because the uh, purchasing power is way 
high than in Georgia, you know. That's why, like, we try to stay in 30-35% margin uh, range. Uh, of course, our segment co covers all expats and also Georgian customers who are medium and high uh, revenue range. Uh, and also some people who does not have so much revenue but have willingness to try something new. They are gourmet, they try to uh, cook some cute stuff uh, like by themselves. They search in the Google some recipes, then they come to us, they buy all ingredients and they do the same at home. But during the pandemic, like sales increased around 1,100%, you know, so like 11 times it increased. That's why we decided to expand. But as we are medium and high, uh, oriented on medium and high segment, that's why um, uh, we cannot open more than six, seven shops. In my first interview, when we opened the gastronomy, I was saying that it will be only one shop in Tbilisi and that's all. Never ever I will open the second one. I was saying it's like very <laughs> concrete and direct, but uh, it happened that we are expanding. That's why you cannot predict what will happen. You know? So uh, we discuss all future possibilities. Another place that caught my attention at the very beginning is this luxury setting located in the heart of Pelissi. Maurice Love, reminding the kind of small boutiques you can easily find in Paris, London or Antwerp, for example, is clearly the place of fashion and design of the Georgian capital. How Nino Eliava and her business partner Anna Mokia succeeded to establish themselves as a benchmark of the luxury industry in Georgia in such a short time. We are going to meet them together now. The concept of Morris Love was born in back in 2011 when uh, I met Annie. I was living in London back then doing my master's degree. Um, I think back then online shopping has been on its boost. Everyone was realizing that it's the future of the retail and uh, uh, we wanted to create an online platform for young and talented brands who do not have the opportunity to work with uh, retailers because they have been on the market for one year or two years and they're fresh and new and no one knows about them. So we wanted to discover the brands and to show them to the world, show them to the customers that potentially are everywhere. And uh, I told this idea to Ani, but initially it was the store that should have been only with the accessories and jewelry, because it was our passion and it was our thing. Our friendship actually <laughs> evolved on that um, topic. And uh, she liked it, we discussed it, and then I said that I was moving, moving to Georgia and that I could do the startup there, because it's a nice market to check the startup and to see how it goes. And uh, that's how it, it was done, yeah. We gradually uh, added ready to wear. And uh, at the moment we had uh, two platforms, Farfetch and Morislove.com. And because the economy started booming in Georgia and the tourism as well, um, it pushed us to open the physical store as well. And it was a huge milestone for us. We've been here for three years now and hopefully in near future will even expand. Uh, we do deal directly with the producer or through the agent, it always depends on the brand. We try to seek up and coming designers from around the world and we offer them our three platforms that are available. Um, we do uh, buying trips to Paris and we discover the brands there or we, we do the trips in London as well and uh, of course at the moment all of that is done online. I think we've had loyal customers from the day one because we've been on the market for nine years now and uh, uh, we love them, they're our family because they helped us to uh, build our business and to um, to be motivated that not only tourists and not only online customers can be loyal to us. Um, 
they're beautiful. Mm. <laughs> they're self-confident because they um, love to wear something that nobody else has uh, because our store offers really exclusive collections that are not produced uh, massively and it's not a mass market. It's a really small uh, productions that produce really exclusive and uh, unique clothing. Mm, uh, all the designers here, they come from different backgrounds, from different countries, um, and uh, I think it's beautiful that we can uh, show in one space Korean, uh, French, uh, Georgian, Russian, uh, Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Yeah, we have a lot of different designers from all over the world and they create this unique feeling when you enter the store and see so much uh, uh, stuff that you haven't seen before. And uh, that's uh, why I think our customers appreciate it that we can create uh, and show them the selections that are very rare. I also love the fact that our loyal customers uh, come to Mars Love to buy the presents and they know that they can find something special for their loved ones. Mm -hmm. Most of the fo foreigners know us, they do the research up front before they arrive to the country so they know their shopping destinations uh, or they know us from the social media or they have been our loyal customers online and when they come in they see um, the link between our online platform and the store itself because it was our aim to show the link between the two platforms. Um, online has been saving us for this uh, really hard period. Um, I think it's it also might be good to challenge a company and to see how strong it is, uh, how, uh, how it can um, come up with new ideas, new visions of how to um, pursue the same goals in a different uh, atmosphere, in different uh, reality that we're now facing. So it gave us uh, a challenge that made us stronger, that uh, proved that we our project is um, quite strong and that we can uh, continue to build up and to expand. Yeah, it has always been our dream and the plan to uh, franchise and open, open more branches around the world. And uh, for sure we're gonna keep on working to accomplish those dreams.